Hi, my name is Met Hatel Masri. Today I'm going to introduce you to ASP.NET Razor Pages. And you will realize that they are much easier to use than ASP.NET MVC. We're going to develop an application that evaluates the future value of an investment, assuming that you regularly invest about, say, $100 at a specific interest rate of, say, 5% for a period of 10 years. After 10 years, you can see how that $100 a month contribution will grow. It is assumed that you have .NET 6.0 installed on your computer. Let's get started. I will go into a command prompt on my Windows machine by typing cmd and it will take me to a command prompt in a particular folder. In this folder I will execute the command .NET new and list and from here you can see that you can develop a bunch of .NET applications but the one we are interested in today is this one here. We're going to build a Razor Pages application. So in order to create that you can use either the word web app or razor. So down here I'm going to do .NET new razor and the output directory will be super web. At this point the app has been created so I can go into the directory and have a look at it. I'm going to open the application in VS Code so I can do that by typing in code dot and it should open up in VS Code. Now in VS Code you have extensions and I'll show you the extensions that are important when you're doing C Sharp development or ASP.NET de development using C Sharp in Visual Studio Code. First of all, you need this extension, which is C Sharp for Visual Studio powered by OmniSharp. And another one I find rather useful is C Sharp extensions. So these are the two extensions I have in VS Code. Let's first look at some of the folders that are here. Now, the important folders are pages, and these pages, they contain the view files, which are the CSHTML files, and the files that have .cshtml.cs extensions. These are the view files, and these are considered to be the code behind files for those view files. So the pages folder is important because it contains all your views and their code behinds. You have the WW root folder contains all the static files. By static files, I mean your CSS files, your JavaScript files, your image files, and you've got also the properties folder that contains this one file called launch settings.json. And this launch settings.json, it contains information on how the application is run in a web server. Specifically, the web server used natively in an ASP.NET Core application is a web server called Kestrel. These are the configurations that control the way that the application would run in Kestrel. And these are the configurations that control the way the application would run in IIS Express. So we'll close this. And there are two more folders we didn't look into. There's the bin folder and the OBJ folder. The OBJ folder contains temporary files that are created during compilation. And the bin folder contains the finally compiled files. VS Code folder contains the settings that you choose when you're using VS Code. Now, what we should do now is run the application and see what it looks like. You can run the application by going .NET run. And there's another variation of this command, which is watch run. The difference between .NET run and .NET watch run is that when you're in watch mode, if there are any changes in the files, it restarts the server. So as a developer, you're probably better off using watch run. So let's do that. Now the application will be compiled and it will run automatically. Another thing that you will notice when you use watch run is there is this aspect of hot reload. If there's any change, not only will the server restart, but also the page in your browser will update. This is what our app looks like now. You have basically two pages. You've got the home page and the privacy page. What are some of the benefits of using ASP.NET Razor pages? Well, some of the benefits are 
the fact that it is lightweight, it's flexible, you have full control of your HTML, and it is cross-platform. In other words, your pages can run on Linux, Mac, or Windows. Also, why would you develop in ASP.NET Razor pages? It's easy to learn, it's well supported, and it's pretty robust. The technologies you would be using with ASP.NET Razor pages are simply C Sharp and basic HTML. Now, let's have a look at one of these pages. For example, let's open up this index.cshtml. This is the view page for your welcome page and this is the code behind for that. In other words, you have the C-sharp code here that supports the view. When you look at the view, we have the first line here is the page directive and this specifies that we're using razor pages. The other directive is the model directive and this directive specifies the model and you've got this block of code that starts with the at open brace and ends with the close brace and this is an island where you can put any C sharp code. It's referred to as a razor code block where, as I said, any C sharp code can go in there. The rest is very HTML-like. We talked about some of the folders and the files that we have in an ASP.NET Razor application. Now, there are some important files also in the root of the application. This one here, the csproj file, is pretty much the project file that describes the entire application. It's also referred to as the manifest file. This file, program.cs, it is really the entry point into your application. It does a bunch of things and at the very end it says app run and at this point the application runs. This file app settings.json and app settings development.json, these two files, they pretty much do the same thing. This is a configuration file that runs anytime, whereas this is also a configuration file and it is in a sense connected to the first one and this runs in development mode only. So your app settings or development or JSON runs only in development mode. Why do you have two of them? Well, there are cases where, for example, you have a connection string that you're using to connect to a database during development time, and you can put the secrets in the app settings.development.json file, and just make sure that this file, you don't deploy it, or you don't even copy it to source control. So all your secrets would be in app settings or development or JSON, and you just keep them on your computer. Don't transfer them to any other place so people don't know your secrets. Everything else can be put in app settings dot json let's make a small change to our application so under pages index.cs html.cs i'm going to put something in the on get method i will pass data from the code behind to the view we will use a view data dictionary to pass information from the code behind page to the view. And that's done by using an object called view data. And you can give it any arbitrary name. For example, I'll just call it name. And in honor of Queen Elizabeth, I will say Queen Elizabeth. Put a semicolon here. This is the code behind page. So we must receive this information in the view page which is index.cshtml so what i can do here is create an h3 tag and i can say view data and put in this value for name and at this point if i run the application here you go you see queen elizabeth it's as simple as that now let us do something a little bit more serious we're going to create a class that knows about calculating a future value for an investment. So New folder. it is customary to create a models folder for that. So I'm going to say and create a models folder. And then inside of this models folder, I will create a file, a new C sharp file. It's going to be a class and I will call it future value. This creates a file called futurevalue.cs 
it automatically provides a namespace. Now the new syntax for namespaces in the current version of C-sharp is to get rid of these braces by simply putting a semicolon here and get rid of these and then push back class definition. I will have three properties that I need to calculate the future value. The first property I'm going to add is of type decimal and I'm going to call it monthly investment. The second property I'm going to have is also a decimal and I will call that yearly interest rate. And we have yet another property and this is the final property that I need and it would be int and this is simply years. Now, in addition to these properties, I will have a method here that is public that calculates the future value of an investment. In the interest of saving time, I'm just going to copy this method here. So this method does the calculation based on the values that are passed into these properties. And it returns a decimal, which represents the future value of an investment. We will next create a page and that will be a razor page that is the view for the future value calculation so to create a page i will use the net utility and the command i'm going to enter is net new page and i want to specify the namespace and the namespace is going to be super web which is the name of my app and it will go into the pages folder so I'll add pages to the namespace and I can specify the name of my view and I will call it future value and the output directory will be the pages directory when you hit enter it will create for you the page and if you go back into VS code and under pages here it is so these two files were created I shall add three properties to this class which is named future value model and those properties will be exactly the same as what I have here so I can pretty much copy this and come back in here and paste them so I'm going to pass a piece of data from the code behind into the view just like we did before the view data dictionary and I'll call that simply FV for future value and I'll set that to zero this method handles the get verb. If I want to handle the post, I will use public void on post. This on post method will pass on future value object. So I can place inside of the argument an object called future value and I'm going to do a control Z here because I'm actually interested in this future value, not this object future value model. And I'll just call this model. In VS Code, you can hit control dot if you are in Windows to import the appropriate namespace. And what we'll do here is we'll pass on the calculated value into the view. So I'm going to copy this and this is going to pass on model dot calculate future value and that should be a semicolon now let's go into the view file and that would be future value dot cshtml i will give this page a title and i can do that using again the view data object and i'm just gonna give it a dictionary key called title and the value can be future value page or any other name you want to give it so this is a code block where you can put in any C sharp code. In here, I want to create a form. So I'm going to open a div tag, and in here, I'm going to start a form with method equals to post. Close the tag like that, and I'll create four div sections. One, we copy this, two, three, four. In the first section, I'm going to create a label. You can use an ASP.NET attribute that points to a property in your model. And that would be ASP for, and for this particular one, we want it to point to the monthly investment. And for the label itself, we will just type in monthly investment, followed by a colon. 
This is the label. The next thing is the input field. In the input field, the value for ASP.NET 4 is the same as with the label. So I can copy and paste this here. And this input field, I can now close it. I'm going to copy this in the interests of saving time into this section. And in this section, I'll use yearly interest rate and copy this over down here and change the text to yearly interest rate. I should delete this. So this becomes yearly interest rate. Again, I will copy this pair and put it in here. And this one will simply use years and years here. I can type in number of years and I'll just bring this value down here. I will copy once again this pair and bring it down here and what I want to display in this section is the result. And the result will simply be future value. So I'll delete this and just display future value here. And the input field will have value equals to, I'm going to use single quotes here, and I will display the contents of the view data. By the way, there's another object called view bag that is just like view data. We can use that if we want to. And the key is FV. We want to change that to two string and we want to display it in currency format. So you can say C2 here as the display format. Finally, we need a button. So I'm going to add a button here and that button will be of type submit and the text that will display is simply calculate. I can also add another link that will clear the form. So I can say ASP action, which means it will submit to a page and that page will be simply empty and simply we'll say clear. Now let's try and see if this is going to work. Let me start my app. Now before I do that, it is always a good idea after you do a lot of work to do a .NET build just to detect if you have any errors. Since it builds OK, I can go ahead and do .NET watch run. Notice here it says Control R to restart. So at any one time while this is running, if you hit Control R, it's going to restart. Now the page that we want to go to, it would be future value. If I hit that, we come to this page. Now let's see if this is going to work. So the monthly investment, let us say you want to put $100 every month. And the interest rate, let's say it is 5%. The number of years you want to make the investment is 10. Now click on calculate and there you go. This works. So what has happened here? How does it work? You enter the values here into these input fields. And when you click on submit, this form submits to the code behind page on post method. Those input fields, they come in as a model and a model object gets instantiated. If you go to the model, which is essentially this class here, these properties get values from the form. And when you call this method, these values, which are already known to the object, they participate in the calculation. The final result is represented by this variable future value, and that gets sent back to the code behind page here. And that gets fed into this view data FV in the view, view data FV, which we can use view bag for it. They're interchangeable gets displayed here. So that was pretty painless. Of course, it's not realistic for your user to enter future value to the URL line. What would be better is if we replace privacy in the menu here with future value. So you can click on it and it takes you to future value. The way you do that is you go into the pages shared folder. Now this file underscore layout represents the master page. Let's go in here and you will see that this link item is the menu item for privacy. Now we're going to replace this with future value. value and the route for that is simply future. Now let's see if this works. Apparently it is broken. So let's try hitting control R on this page so we can restart the server. Sometimes you need to do that to get it all started. 
Now that the server has started, let's go to the root page here. There you go, and we have future value and it's all working. If you look at the page source, we can do that by choosing view page source. You will notice that we have bootstrap that's loaded as CSS. We should make this a little bit more attractive. It doesn't look really professional. So let's improve it by using some bootstrap. So I'm going to close my layout file and go back into my view. And in my view for this div section, I'm going to use a bootstrap class called form group. And I'll do this for all the others as well. Oh, I discovered now that I have a div section that's not closed properly. Let me close this here and reformat my UI. Now this seems to be more correct. So I'm going to copy this and put it here and here and here. For each one of these fields, if it's a label, I can use another class called control label. So I'm going to say class equals to control label. You will see later that this these changes that I'm making will make the page look much more professional. So I'm copying over all of these labels down to the other tags. Next, the input fields has to have, oh, I made a mistake here with the, with the spelling of control. It should have an O. Let me change all of these to O's. Now, the input fields have to have a class called form control. I'll put them in the input fields here, here, and here. Now, because this is going to display the output, I can set it to be read only because I don't want anybody entering anything in this field. Finally, for the buttons, I should also put the buttons in a form group div section. So let me copy this and bring this down here and my div, I'll copy it over to the bottom. I know that it would be nice for me to put a line break here to push the buttons away from the rest of the UI. For the button, I wanted to give it a color. And in Bootstrap, we can do that by giving it a class value of BTN. And there is another type of button called BT and primary, which gives you a blue colored button. We can do the same for the anchor. Let us copy this, bring it down here and make that success, which gives us a green button. Let's see what happens now if we have something that looks a little bit better. So if we go down to our page, it seems to be broken. Let me try it again and click on here. The page is broken, so we have a problem. To fix that problem, I simply did a control C on the server and I restarted it again and determined that it works fine, no problem. Here it is. Let's click on future value and let's see that it's working okay. So we said 100 at 0.05 for 10 years and you click on calculate, it gives you the proper number. This looks much nicer. I hope you agree with me. One thing we did not do is that we gave the page a title but we didn't display this title anywhere. So maybe what we should do down here is create an H1 tag and pretty much display this. So I can copy this, put an at before it and paste it. I made a mistake here. There shouldn't be a space between the at and view data. So we try again. Yeah, here it is. And now I have a page title. Another improvement we can make is to delete these strings because the whole purpose for using ASP4 is for ASP.NET to display the property names from the model. So I deleted all three texts in the three labels, the first three labels, but this one, of course, I left it because it doesn't have a property. So now let's see if th this is going to work. Let me do a control R here and see if it's going to work. So if I hit enter now, you see the label comes from the name of the model. Where is that model? The model is essentially this monthly investment and monthly investment here. You will notice that there seems to be this in the model duplicated. It's duplicated 
in the code behind and it's duplicated. So maybe we can get away with just having one of these places containing these properties. There is certainly a solution for that. What we can do is go to the code behind, delete this, and instead create a property here called future value. And the property is of type future value, and we can even call it future value. Now, why do we have a squiggle under here? Because it says that this is a nullable property. To get around with that, we can just put a question mark here. Next, we should add an attribute here called bind property. In my on post method, because I set this as a bind property, I don't really need to pass any arguments to the on post method. And that means that here I would just say future value because I already defined a future value property. And because this is nullable, I need to use exclamation mark here to unwrap it. Now you will notice that we have some errors in this future value.cshtml page because it has turned red. If you come down here, many of these squiggles represent errors. And if you read any one of this error, it says future value model does not contain a definition for yearly interest rate. This means that we have to fully qualify this monthly investment object by putting before it future value dot and we'll do it for all the others. Now there is a warning here. It says that the reference of a possibility null reference just like down here we unwrapped a nullable value over here we should do the same. So we put an exclamation on all of these and that warning will go away. So I think we're all good now. Let's run our app and see if it works as expected. Come down here. Let me go to the root of the app again. Click on future value and enter say we said $100 at interest rate of 5% for 10 years. It does that and clear clears it. So it seems to be okay except that I detect one problem. These labels are not user friendly. You want to put a space between monthly and investment and maybe you want to put something else here instead of years. Maybe you want to say number of years. So in the model you can specify the display text. Let's go now to the model and over each one of these properties we can have an attribute called display and of course this is not recognized. You have to hit control dot in Windows to import the appropriate namespace. So once that's known you can open a bracket and type in name equals to and in quotations we want to put the word monthly investment. And we will do the same for yearly interest rate. So I'm just copying that and putting it above yearly interest rate. And I can take all of this, paste it here, and just put a space in between the word. And finally, for years, I'll copy this and bring it down again to years. And for this, I'll say number of years. Now let us see that our labels are more user friendly. So from the home page, we click on future value. And as you can see here, our labels are more user friendly and our application still works. 0.05 for 10 years and we get the same result and our clear button works. Thank you for coming this far in this video again. And if you like it, please give it the thumbs up. And until I see you, cheers.